I asked our audience earlier um, what they want to be when they were younger, because I think it's really interesting, the starting story. I've got these four words that I use all the time, start now, start simple, because sometimes the journey brings you on some really amazing adventures. Can you share about your adventure? What was your starting, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Actually, hello everyone. Uh, from the very early age, seeing all the movies, reading books, I, I think I wanted to be in equity, trading, uh -huh. um, investing. But of course, um, behind the Bloomberg blinking screens, because that's what you see in the movies. Yes. And I ended up in... Uh, well, it depends what movie you watch. <laughs> but, okay, your movies, all right. And, and now? And I actually ended up with very small screen, never blinking, <laughs> in alternative assets, venture capital. Nice. So I'm really excited about this conversation because you're going to be talking about green tech investments. Yes. Uh, and I know the people here that are in the audience are also keen on that conversation. So I'm going to leave the stage to you. Guys, can we give a nice warm welcome to our panelists as they come up on stage? Hello everyone, I'm Silla, I'm from SmartCap, uh, and SmartCap is a state-backed venture capital fund with a focus on Estonian venture capital funds, providing cornerstone tickets there. And we just launched the Green Fund, which is going to invest in companies that are contributing to green transition and, and uh, invest in technologies that are trying to solve the big climate problems. Um, so I'm really delighted to welcome two experts on the stage with me today to discuss the role of emerging green technologies in green transition. Vicky from World Fund, you're investing in um, technologies uh, to reduce carbon footprint. And Bindi, you're basically at the center of startup ecosystem. Uh, you are, um, you have global reach, you're a venture partner at Molten Ventures, you're a venture partner at um, Minds Fund. I just stop here, please introduce yourself and also your approach to green tech investments. You go first. I'll go first. You, oh. you go first. You go first. <laughs> oh gosh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I come at it from a more generalist perspective and, and I think the, the work that I'm doing in several funds um, really shows to me how much of a trend it is. And it's no longer about accelerating the adoption, it is being adopted. So that's the first observation I'd make. So the several hats I wear, um, I'm on the investment committee for Carbon 13, which is an accelerator based in Cambridge in the UK. And that's, it's a bit like an entrepreneur first, but really focused on net zero. So the founders are all great in their space. They come together, they, they create the business, and then about six months into the program, we actually invest in the company. And we're, we're just finished cohort two, and we're about to go into cohort three. And it's actually very interesting to see the companies that are coming up out of it. So we're seeing it at the super earliest creation stage. Uh, next, I'm a venture partner at a US-based fund called um, Minds Fund, and what they're focused on is actually the advancement of energy. So they're looking at you know, 20, 30 years in the future and really focusing on what do we need to invest in to really address the crisis that we're in right now. And just to give you an example of the partners there, they're the team that invested in SpaceX and Tesla. So they're really focused on the far, far future. And I'm here to help you know, on the ground in Europe and be their eyes and ears and send them deal flow. Global fund and just an absolutely incredible group to work with. And then the third area is at Molten Ventures where we are a generalist European fund, but actually from there, the kind of level of deal flow we're seeing in climate uh, tech, we have actually a couple of investors on the team that are really 100% focused in that space. And one of them actually was a, uh, a climate tech founder. And what we're seeing is just the level of deal flow coming up. And I, I can talk a little bit about our investments later, but actually looking at it from all ends of the market, from a fund one with Minds Fund to early creation through to you know big series B rounds, 
we're seeing it throughout the whole market. So I don't think it's about accelerating the adoption, the adoption's there, and it is very much part of the investment hypothesis of most of the funds that I'm seeing right now. Thank you, Vicky. What's your approach uh, and how, how do you invest in green tech? Yeah, sure. So I'm working for the, the World Fund. So we're a 350 million climate tech fund and we invest all across Europe, but also the rest of the world where we see that technologies in other regions are really going to dominate globally. And we have one core thesis, and that's that the value driver for the future is decarbonization. Um, and therefore, we'll only invest in startups with the potential to abate 100 megatons of CO2 or equivalent, and that's on an annual basis by 2040. So we're really looking at the time value of carbon as well. So something that's an incremental change now, is it going to really disrupt things in the future as well? So we look across five main verticals, the real carbon emitting sectors, energy, food, agriculture, land use, transport, mobility, buildings and materials and manufacturing as well. Thank you. The environmental struggle is real. I mean, it's evident and, and it's something that is hard to ignore. It's getting more and more expensive to deal with. It was already 2011 when, uh, when the European Commission rolled out the roadmap how to get to carbon neutral economy. And in 2020, when the Green Deal was signed to be uh, climate neutral by 2050, how do you see we're proceeding and when do you expect us to gain momentum? Vicky? <laughs> I mean, this is a huge challenge. If you take like um, the GDP of Western economies, it's 80% of this needs to be decarbonized. It's absolutely massive. And how are we doing? Well, I think we can see we're not doing very well there yet. There is a huge amount to go. We've taken some of the low hanging fruits, but it's the really hard to decarbonize industries that are next and um, so much work needs to go into this and also so much capital. So when do I think that shift will come? I think we're seeing it. Um, you're seeing so many startups now, as you were just alluding to. Uh, people are really recognizing the issues. ESG is you know, the buzzword of the moment. Um, but actually putting the money there and the time it will take, I, I think we're, we're cutting it fine. <laughs> Um, I, I could probably answer a bit to that one as well. So I, I wear multiple hats. Um, you know, I'm not very good at just committing to one thing. So one of the hats I also wore for many years was sitting on the board of the European Innovation Council. I'm now an ambassador for them uh, because I'm British, so not European anymore, which is a shame. But what the EIC was about was a deep tech fund. And the pilot ran from 2017 to 2021, and we invested about 3 billion euro into deep tech founders across Europe. The fund now, as of end of 2021, it's a 10 billion euro fund over the next um, seven years. In that first tranche, in the pilot, there, was, there were calls to apply for funding. And one of the main calls, I think it was something like, 800 million plus, and, and don't quote me on that number, but it was a significant chunk of that 3 billion euro budget, which was we want to look at startups that are building and solving problems related to the European green agenda. So the fact that governments are putting out calls and saying they're funding deep tech innovation and innovators and science and researchers specific to the green agenda tells me yeah, we have a way to go, but the fact that they're putting their money where their mouth is tells me we're, we're, we're in the right direction. We don't have a choice, really, do we? So, Do we have a choice? You mentioned adoption. We did recently uh, research among our green tech companies and green, green tech investors, and something that really popped up was actually the fact that market is not ready. The, you know, ready for green transition. We're talking about customer adoption. We're talking about corporate readiness, regulatory environment that still seems to be reluctant. Do you think the market is ready, Bindi? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like I'm getting picked on here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I think what I would observe is, let's look at retail investors. And we were having this conversation yeah. backstage, which is, if you look at the generational wealth, 
it's slowly moving towards Gen Z and millennials. And Gen Z and millennials invest with purpose. They really do care about the social agenda and the green agenda. And they're starting to become very activist shareholders. And what I'm noticing is a lot of these um, larger funds are having to think about where does that money go? Activist shareholders. So I'll give you a good example of a company in the UK that just raised, um, I think it's a 12 million Series A, called Tumelo. And what's cool about Tumelo is the four founders were actually students at Cambridge, and the Cambridge Endowment Fund was one of the largest university endowments worldwide beyond Harvard and Yale. And they started to become really activist investors saying, why are you putting money in the endowment into these kind of companies? So whether it's tobacco or military or whatever, and they became super activist investors. And from that came a platform. And that platform is now used by a lot of asset managers, which actually enable retail investors to track where that money is going. So there's actually a real demand from the retail end, and I do think it's coming from the younger generations. I'm solidly Gen X, so you know we don't care about anything in life. You know, our, our, our parents threw us on the plane at age six and hope we got to you know the next country, and that was fine. But the point being is the new generations, it's happening, and I'm seeing it, and I'm seeing the passion. And then the last comment I'd make is some number, something like 70% of the workforce will be Gen Z and millennials by 2030, right? And they're not going to join a company or create companies without that type of thinking. So I think it's coming. That's, that's a bit, you know, comforting to hear that. Vicky, why do you think is the market ready or what could be done to even accelerate the green transition through green tech innovation? I think in a sense we have to move around a bit with financial incentives. So back to your point there about um, are people really taking this up? When you look at delivery companies, for example, um, when people are presented with the option of can I get a green delivery for a slight change in price or can I get a typical delivery, they will always go for the green delivery. That's kind of what things are showing and one of our former portfolio companies said that. But they don't want to pay the green premium. And I just don't think there should be a green premium. So we need to move around with things, experiment, be a little bit more bold with things like a carbon tax or how we're kind of moving the money around. And I think that will make a huge difference. And the other thing is, where are the big funding gaps, as I was mentioning earlier? So in, in, uh, in climate tech, you see that in Europe, we have the most amount of patents in the world in climate. We have the most startups being founded in climate. It is incredible. But then they hit a wall. They get their initial funding, they get their initial support, but then they don't have the funding for the next stages. So it's about money. <laughs> Binti, I thank you for, for mentioning uh, the new generation of customers and, and future employees and their expectations, because I want to make a sh slight shift here in this conversation, oh, no. <laughs> because we all understand the purpose of green transition. We are sitting on purpose stage, stage here. And however, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and recent renewable energy sort of hype has overshadowed something that is equally important we sort of seem to forget the ESG factors and, and reduce very often the carbon footprint while leaving dirty drugs behind. So how are we managing to integrate ESG framework to green tech investing? Do you want to go first? Because <laughs> that's sort of what you do, right? As yeah, a fund, right? So, yeah. so the question was, how do we integrate ESG, ESG framework into... to green tech investing? Yeah, well, for us, we do that you know, for the full start to end of the investment. So even from the beginning, you have a kind of ESG list of areas that you want to invest in, but then it's taking it all the way through. So it needs to be a part of your investment proposal, part of your investment thesis. You need to analyze all of the risks. And then later, I think where a lot of funds fall down is that they do that, but then they don't support the portfolio companies in the next stages. 
So you make the investment and then you go, okay, now, now we're done. That is, that's when the work begins. So it's trying to find a way to help portfolio companies incorporate ESG into how they operate and not going with just ESG checklists, tick, tick, tick. That doesn't help anybody. It's tailoring. It's making it relevant for what they do. Um, being there on the board, but you don't need to be on a board to do this. You just offer the sounding advice and helping them take advantage of why ESG will support them with their growth. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about it from the perspective of Molten Ventures because really ESG is quite core to our agenda because if people don't know, Molten is actually publicly listed. It's a different type of unique venture capital model. We're listed on the FTSE 250 in London and we actually have an in-house ESG working group. I sit down part of that because for me, d is a huge part of what I believe in as a woman of color. So I really want to make sure that we think about it. So for us, we kind of have metrics that we report. Even though it might seem like a tick box, we report it to the stock exchange because it's also what the shareholders want. So we're really driven by that. As a part of that, with our portfolio, we've got 65 plus companies, we share that reporting with them, and that gives them their own structure by which to think about ESG. So we're taking our experience, sharing it with the portfolio, and we're getting them to really um, think about that in how they run their business, but also you know, giving us their insights as well. And actually, we're putting money into more of the companies in the space, so they're teaching us as well. So I think it, it has to be sort of in-house and coming from the top of the partnership. Um, and for us, it's a little bit easier because it's part of how we report to shareholders. But even to me, let's look at the value chain of venture. Classically, you've got LPs, then you've got the VC funds, and you've got the portfolio companies. So my question and challenge is, what are the LPs doing mm. to add those metrics in and therefore encouraging their VC, investee com VC investees to do the same. So I think it has to go through the whole value chain of the innovation economy and the industry. I see a lot of nods in the audience, so it's got to start from the top in my view. I can jump in. A, I also think KPIs are a really powerful tool. What I think is really important is to actually tailor them to the company. When you're a VC, you should look at the startup and say, what are the KPIs that are useful for you? I, I don't want to just send a list of all of these different KPIs, just like give us this, this, this. But diversity and inclusion is a great example. That absolutely data driven. What are the percentages? How is that looking? And it goes all the way through to LPs. It's interesting because increasingly I am starting to see that the LPs are looking for this data as well. So Yeah, well, someone's above them in the stack. So who's you know, pushing them mm. <laughs> because they are the big asset managers. So maybe they are run by shareholders. You just don't know. But the point is, is it has to go through all parts of the cycle. And absolutely, there's not one size fits all. But actually, if you have that insight about how you're running your own fund, mm. it's good to share with the portfolio, right? And they can take what suits them. And I think as a responsible board member, it has to be core to the agenda. So, yeah. yeah. Do you also see um, LPs integrating sort of impact or ESG KPIs to incentivization schemes? How, uh, for example, do, do uh, profit distribution cascades and, and uh, maybe impact uh, hurdles on top of IRR hurdles? Well, for us, well, the way we structure it is that for our carry as a fund, um, we only get a proportion of the carry linked to financial return, and the other proportion of the carry is linked to the impact that we make. And increasingly, we're starting to see LPs ask, ask around whether we're doing that or not. So I think that's really nice. That's a positive signal. So, so there are first signals that LPs are looking at it and, and set clear expectations that this financial performance can't come at all costs. It has to be conscious and, and responsible. Mm -hmm. But I think also an increasing recognition that financial performance and impact aren't these, you know, contradictory things, you know. Yeah. You can, I think the future is making the most impact is where you will see the most financial return and I, that's changing. Yeah. And, and yeah. exactly what I'd observe there is the rapid rise of emerging green tech and impact funds. I've never seen so many new fund managers and new VC funds in the last three to five years that are really focused on this space and a lot of first-time fund managers. So I think 
it, the wave is here and it is happening, just as an out, anecdotal observation of what I'm seeing, like funds like yours, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And with the sustainable finance regulations that have come through, you get increasing numbers of LPs that are looking for Article 9 funds. So that's a really high bar to meet, so definitely. So ESG is not just ticking the boxes. Vicky, did I get you right behind the scenes that you also turn very often ESG matters into sort of green tech investment opportunities? I think if you... So ESG is about risk management, but obviously managing risk is also an opportunity for investment. And we were, we were also talking about this, but one of our portfolio companies, COA, you wouldn't immediately think of them as a climate tech company. What they do is they substitute cocoa in the supply chain for something that they make themselves using precision fermentation. And taking the co diversifying the cocoa supply chain does have a huge climate impact. But what you're also really looking at is the social risk of that supply chain. We all know that there are issues in terms of child labor. Um, and therefore, companies and looking at ESG as a whole, you see this huge risk, but actually, it's also an opportunity for investment. Yeah, I mean, why not invest in the robots that are going in the mines to harvest the cobalt that we need for our electric vehicle batteries, right? And, and I think it's that kind of thinking. Let, let's invest in the picks and shovels and the technologies that are going to be much greener to harvest what we need to be green. <laughs> so again, it's kind of a self-perpetuating circle. So. so what do you think the road ahead looks like how are, what do we need to do uh, and, and what are the biggest challenges that we need to overcome to accelerate the green transition and, and adoption? I think it just, we got to stop talking about it as a separate topic. To me, it's, it's crazy that we're still doing that. It just needs to be part and parcel of how we do business today. So and I think and until we do that and, you know, we, we should be firing ourselves as a panel. We shouldn't be talking about this. It should just be core to how we think and how we work. So I think that's kind of the next step that we need to think about. And I, you can see that coming from capital markets and you know, what shareholders who are becoming much younger are starting to expect. So I think it just has to be part of what we do every day. And a different part of this, is, I think, is bringing more people into the conversation. So I mean, it's the same all across society right now, but you have these bubbles and climate is no different. I think you need to bring different stakeholders in and you also need to bring in different people who are taking on the challenge. Um, I also run the foundation, the Climate Tech Foundation, which is all around diversity in this space. Yeah. And a lot of what we're trying to do is make sure, well, we have this saying that uh, the people tackling this problem should reflect the world that we live in. You know, all different people, shapes, sizes, nationalities and also all different stakeholders. You can't just have investors and startups talking to each other. You need the consumer in the conversation. Yeah. You need the policymaker in the conversation. So the more we can facilitate that, the more I think we'll drive change. Yeah, and I, I would absolutely echo that. I, the work that I do, I class my world into an innovation ecosystem, and that's corporates, that's investors, that's government. It's the community and ecosystem like we have here and it's the entrepreneurs and the founders. And it, it kind of has to permeate through all of the ecosystem for it to make sense. Yeah. It can't just be us in our little bubble at Latitude 59 and the lovely Talon. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's got to be outside of this bubble. Yeah. We have to collaborate across the whole ecosystem. Does this new thinking and new generation uh, have the power to actually phase out the old technologies that are really, you know, dominating, still dominating the global markets. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that. Uh, uh, do, do, we, do these new generation people, um, new technologies, do they have power to sort of push out or phase out the old technologies that are still existing and dominating? I don't think we're there yet, <laughs> but I do think the, the wave of change is coming. Um, and uh, I think the older generation needs to start sitting up and listening to the younger generation. We, we can all learn from each other. So I know it's a terrible answer, but we're not there yet. So, <laughs> But we still have some 30 years to go, it, which is actually a, a shifting generation. Quick. Yeah, it will go quickly. Well, yeah, we're now in the coronial generation, aren't we? The number of babies I've seen born in the last two years is, it's incredible. So yeah, the coronials is what I call them. 
Bueno, <risa> 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 Nicky, do you want to add anything? I just, I think I have a lot of faith in the next generations coming through and a, a lot of hope for change. Also not a good answer, but uh, I think we have to believe it or... Yeah. yeah, us Gen Xers that don't really care need to be, you know, drag kicking and screaming a bit. <laughs> We're the, you know, whatever generation. <laughs> it sounds like we're getting there and we might get there actually quite organically or, you know, just with natural changes over years. Um, we have some questions from the audience as well. So let's see, uh, that's a good one. How much greenwashing do you see? Do, do you think this, this movement or trend is actually generating some greenwash, giving some ground to it? I mean, yeah, there's, there's greenwashing everywhere. <laughs> like, we can't pretend there isn't. So many companies are jumping on the bandwagon right now and, and, and pitching themselves as sustainable. And that's, well, in the end, that's, that's great as long as it's legitimate. Um, but I think increasingly what we're seeing as well is more companies coming through that are trying to validate that, and I like that. So with the sustainable finance regulations, that's a part of that, the EU taxonomy coming through and trying to define exactly what it is to be sustainable. But you see that at every level. There's so many companies emerging trying to say, are they sustainable, are they not, and make that a data-driven exercise. So yes, there's a greenwashing wave right now. How long the companies will be able to maintain that, I, I, don't, I don't think it's there. But the fact that this does have so much momentum is ultimately a positive thing. And soon they've made their claims, they're gonna have to stick to them. I'll, I'll tell a story, because I like storytelling. And one of my good friends, she works for an asset manager, and she's the head of ESG. And, um, you know, no one cared about her role. She knew it was a tick box exercise, like, five years ago, right? And she's like, she was super frustrated, like, you know, come on, come on, I'm pushing away at it. And all of a sudden, she's in such demand, and... You know, now the CEO of the asset manager is really looking at the work she's doing and, you know, she's never been so busy. So when it does get to the, you know, boardroom level and they're thinking about it um, and the ESG, you know, for the person in charge of ESG for that fund and investing strategies, the greenwashing has been there for a long time, but just seeing how busy my friend is, that's a start, right? Um, I've also also just recently joined as an NED for a mobility services organization, a large uh, listed company. And ESG is core to their annual report because they're managing commercial vehicle fleets. And you know they've made the pledge to go full electric vehicle in, in a certain period of time. And two years ago, I wouldn't have seen, I didn't see that in their annual report even three years ago. So you are seeing it put in writing to shareholders uh, and investors. So, yeah, greenwashing has been there, but I think just anecdotally, I'm seeing it move. I, I, yeah, I call it the Titanic, right? Not the Titanic, the, that's a bad one, but the super tanker, right? The super, yeah, that's a bad word, sorry. But the super tanker is starting to shift, is what I would observe, anecdotally, of course. I think there are some questions uh, about what could be done to, um, for, you know, angel investors, every kind of investors maybe who don't have exo exhaustive ESG lists or, or who, doesn't, who don't really understand EU taxonomy. What are some easy, easy tips or, or um, key solutions to, to um, identify and avoid greenwashing while investing? It's probably for you. So this would be greenwashing in a, in a startup, I guess? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there isn't any kind of guidebook for ESG assessment, so it's not like this is really particularly different for an angel investor or a VC fund. Um, in the sense, like, simply, it's a risk assessment. So being aware of the different risks, really sitting down with the startup and walking through the different aspects of what they build. Um, for a software company, it's different issues to a hardware company. Um, so my tip would just be to sit down and... and 
walk through it and maybe speak to a few people in the space and see what they see as the risks and, and just come at it that way uh, as a risk mitigation exercise and it will lead you down the right paths of uh, whether any greenwashing is going on or not. Sounds like it, the key is to understand the technology where you're investing in. Yeah. So thank you for very good insight. I think we're out of time now. And and yes. <laughs> thank you. Great. Yeah, thank Thanks. You. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.